Hello and welcome back on a conversation artificial intelligence today. And Paul is your host. And today with us, we have Jennifer Pranky, who is the VP of machine learning and artificial intelligence at Figure 8, a startup here in the Silicon Valley area. Hello, Jennifer. How are you today? Hi, Paolo. I'm very good today. Thank you for having me. Thank you. It's a pleasure having you. So, Jennifer, before we go you know, on this interesting topic of machine learning and particularly data, so we're going to talk about data today, we would like to learn something about you. And let me ask it in a special way, let's say. So, why your title is VP of Machine Learning, and I actually added artificial intelligence, so apologize. So why is machine learning and not artificial intelligence? That's actually an interesting question. So I think, you know, like, well, I think, you know, like the company has realized that artificial intelligence was a little bit of a buzzword. And so, you know, like uh, eventually uh, at the end of the day, we spend a lot of time building machine learning models, even though the final application that we have in mind for these machine learning models is to empower AI companies to to build whatever they're building. So yeah, I mean, it could eventually be both, but I think it's like from a marketing standpoint, it's more reasonable to consider that the problem is machine learning first before shooting for AI, general AI. (laughs) All right, so no buzz, no marketing buzz. Exactly. With, with Jennifer then. So let's, let's look a little bit about, you know, a little bit about yourself. How would you, you know, if you were, went back to your native town in France and talked to your, you know, high, high school friends, how would you describe your career so far? What, what it is that you have been doing? So I'll tell you this. So it was my childhood dream to become a physicist. And I did become a physicist. I actually have a PhD in particle physics. And unfortunately, I graduated at uh, the worst time possible at the beginning of the recession. And there wasn't like real, like a a real good opportunity to have like the proper funding to do uh, the type of research I was uh, hoping to do. So, uh, you know, like I, I think that people would be expecting me to be a particle physicist right now. And so I would probably start by saying that, like, look, uh, I did become a particle physicist. Like I always dream, nothing has changed. And the reason why I'm doing today what I'm doing is I'm really using my math skills and every single uh, skill I acquired as a physicist to do data analysis. And uh, I'm analyzing a lot of data in the uh, context of my job. So, I mean, really think of me as uh, the same old math person, math geek, who now is trying to use really cool techniques acquired as a physicist to do something even cooler in the context of empowering other companies to uh, build cool robots or interesting applications for lots of different industries ranging from medical companies to e-commerce okay so very good I, not, not sure i would if i was 18 years old would, would uh, follow all the you know details of the medical companies but we will try to clarify them as we go further in the in the conversation so what about your hobbies instead so what what brought you here in the united states what are the things that you like besides work so tell us a little bit about that So, uh, well, I mean, so, I mean, obviously I've always been interested in everything math related. So it's always like a, even when I do something else, it usually lends itself to like geeky conversation with other people, but like other things I, I enjoy doing, like I include uh, reading, advising other people, how they should, you know, like uh, build their own careers. Actually, I'm very big into like uh, empowering women to go into STEM. And so on a sweeter note, I, I have several dogs and I love my dogs. I love spending time with my girls. So you were asking how I got there in the US. So I I mean, originally, like when you do particle physics, you don't have a lot of choices in terms of where you can do your PhD. And so I was actually interested in the research that was happening at Slack at Stanford University over there. And so when I like I finished my PhD, I actually realized that uh, the cool things happening in science and in technology were actually in the US. So I naturally like moved over there. And yeah, I decided to stay. So very good. That's, that's kind of the path that a lot of us have taken. That was kind of my path as well. Then I, I came to the US, I was doing research, and eventually I, I also sold to the, I would say, broader and appealing economic opportunities or career development opportunities here in the United States. So very good. With that said, there is a lot more of, than science to 
the various passions and interests that you have. But now we're going to go back a little bit around, if not science, but the technology that you are developing and how it, uh, you know, how it makes an impact for other companies. Maybe we can start saying something about Future Aid, what it does and what type of problems it attempts to solve. All right, absolutely. So, so Figure Eight is actually a fairly new company in the sense that we rebranded recently, but we are originally a company called Crowdflower. And so ever since the company was founded, our mission has been to provide other companies with training data. So we're basically, we were the, for the first like uh, enterprise solution for data labeling. And so lots of people know data lab- labeling through Amazon Mechanical Turk, but Amazon Mechanical Turk has, I mean, if you used it before, you know that it's not necessarily enterprise grade. There are no like uh, control checks. And uh, so when you're, you're a real AI company or AI team and you need high quality labels for your data, you would typically go to us. And so the reason why we rebranded recently is that we realized that in an age of big data, labeling manually is not going to fly. And so eventually, like the concept of like crowd flower being focused on crowd, therefore people and manual labeling, we had to move towards the future, which is like uh, automation of labeling. And so, so before we go into that, as the audience, you know, can be pretty wide and, and there can certainly be data scientists that are totally familiar with the, the concept of uh, data preparation, data labeling. Can we kind of set the stage and explain all the overall importance of data preparation in Mm -hmm. all the machine learning processes, trying to understand why this is something that that matters and why we even have companies that, you know, take this role in the value chain? No, so, so data preparation is a very wide topic. And so obviously we don't do all of it. So, I mean, I think like if you look at surveys from people working in the field, they will tell you typically they spend 80 to 90% of their time working on data preparation. So you can just see how important it would be for uh, anyone to get some help around this. So, I mean, data preparation really ranges from like removing bad data outliers, selecting the right features, so the right, like a, a, you know, like a build the right format for your data. And there is a principle over there too, like to do something called data augmentation, which is like a generalized version of uh, uh, annotation. So think like, I will give you a very specific example. If I'm a self-driving car company uh, and I want to build self-driving software, I'm going to have lots of images coming from my, um, my front video, like a camera in my car. And then you have to do something with it. And obviously, this something could be I want to identify what is a tree, what is a pedestrian, and what is another car. And so when you get these images, they're going to be raw. And if you want to build machine learning models to identify pedestrians, you need something to, to tell you what is a pedestrian. And so it's a little bit of a chicken and egg problem here, because if you want to build models to identify pedestrians, then you need training data, labeled training data to actually tell you on a fairly small sample or smaller than what you you want to apply your algorithm on, what is a pedestrian and what is a tree. And so typically what you see people do is like they draw bounding boxes, so rectangles essentially around pedestrians on these images. And this label data becomes the input to building a machine learning model. And so you have different ways of doing that. Um, Bounding boxes is one example. It's probably the most common one, but you have lots of different things to do. So you have to have some level of intelligence injected onto the data to basically tell you as a starting point, look, my AI algorithm, I'm going to tell you what a pedestrian looks like so that you can learn from this. And so this first step is getting more and more time consuming and expensive because our machine learning algorithms are becoming greedy and they require more data. So it means that you need to have more labeling done. And so that's that's the challenge here. So in terms of this type of challenge that, you know, various companies will face, why do they prefer to outsource this service as opposed to trying to, you know, develop capabilities in-house? So maybe that is uh, something that would be interesting to figure out why. 
So that's that's actually I'm I'm glad you're asking that question because I think it's a nice sequel to like a, a more details around what we do here exactly. So yes, you do have uh, companies trying to do that internally, but it's obviously something that's extremely time challenging, right? Like, uh, time time consuming. So I'll go back to the uh, uh, origin of Crawlflower when Figure Eight was Crawlflower. Our founder Lucas actually we, like he, he was working for like for you know like companies that needed this type of labels and he realized that he was spending so much time doing labeling internally and it does not really make sense to have your senior engineers your senior data scientists who are like pretty expensive workforce do that part of the work and so the concept of outsourcing is number one you can ask lots of different people to do this so basically you want to have a wide range and wide network of people capable of drawing boxes on an image and those don't need to have a phd in uh, in science or in technology right and then there is also i mean for that reason you can label things faster by outsourcing you can also guarantee that you have a higher diversity or guarantee that the results are going to be unbiased in some sense. And so that being said, I will say that on the other side of the spectrum, you have people that even though it is expensive to label everything manually, the fact you're outsourcing this is also creating a problem that you are sharing your data with someone else that you don't know, right? And so that requires like a, some level of security as well. So to solve that problem, Figure 8 actually also offers on-prem solutions. So we can also like offer the software for labeling and empower our customers to do the work internally or using their own crowds and, and still benefit from, from our software. So now let's go a little bit more into your you know, data background, your data science background. So you mentioned that uh, one of the reasons why people come to a service that is specialized in uh, data labeling or some elements of the data preparations uh, workflow is because of data diversity and removing bias from data. Tell us why this is important and how important it is in machine learning. Well, that's, that's an entire topic in itself, right? I mean, so for me, like, and uh, that's one of my like favorite topics to talk about, but like machine learning algorithms can be biased, but they will be biased if you give them biased data. And so people tend to forget that the biases don't necessarily come from the technology, from the algorithm. It comes from what you feed into this algorithm. And so I, I will almost say that machine learning inherits the biases generated by humans through the way we generate data. And so it can be either the way we collect data or it can be the way we label data. So there are lots of examples that we have on our system of customers trying to label the, you know, like, maybe like how dark is the skin of a specific person. And so if you are, you're a black person or a Caucasian person, you might have different views of how black a person is. So, and it gets really sensitive, right? I mean, so the way we actually like, we can solve this problem is. What is exactly the problem? So different people have a different perception of, mm -hmm, exactly, of, right? of, of the darkness of the skin. How does it manifest itself then radically? No, it's, it's essentially like a lot of the tasks involved in labeling are subjective, right? I mean, another example would be like, do you think this tweet is offensive? And depending on your, your background, the way you were raised, you're going to have a different answer. So what you can do, and this is actually like part of the, the benefit of using a company like us, we don't ask just one person. We will ask a range of person. And as for like recently, we, we have developed solutions that make sure you get a range across a specific features. So for example, if you know that for content moderation, it's important to have diversity in terms of gender, then we make sure that you get that diversity from the people that are going to label this. The other thing that's important to understand is you can ask several people to label the same image or the same tweet, and then you can aggregate that information so that you re reduce the variance that can be caused by the fact that you have sole uh, opinions for people, from people. Right? And so if that internally, it, it becomes challenging because you don't have that wide range of crowd to, to go to. So I'd love to ask you something a little bit
the, the computer vision to industrial applications and so on and so forth. How do you know what type of biases the data can uh, be affected and how do you know what type of countermeasures you have to take in each and every right. case? No, so I guess your, your main question here is, is how do you ensure you don't have biases and that's probably the hardest question here, right? I mean, so it's extremely difficult to accurately measure biases or the absence of biases. I would say that it's even harder to do that on the data. I would probably go to check that the algorithm that was built with this data is actually unbiased. But I mean, measuring it in an accurate and fair way is extremely difficult. But you were also asking another question. How do you know what features or where, where diversity is actually like important for removing biases. And so that's, that's where we have a, a really unique competitive advantage on the, rest of the, uh, on the rest of the world on this. So we've been doing labeling for almost 10 years now. And basically we've, we've seen so many different use cases across industries, across tasks. And for instance, we can check that on our system, people labeling tweets, for instance, right? You can see that the distribution of the answers that we obtain from women and from men is actually very different. So it tells you that if you had more women or like a majority of women or a majority of men, you would have something that would generate or potentially could generate a bias, right? And then we can do the same check across age, for instance, and maybe across age or across location, you don't see that kind of variance or that kind of differences across the distributions of the answers of our contributors, contributors being the person uh, performing the annotation task. And so given that knowledge, we know that given the task you're trying to go through today, does it matter that you get diversity for age? And does it, does it matter that you get uh, diversity in terms of gender or something else? So this is, this is very interesting. So basically, the long experience has been accumulated that some of the statistical analysis has been done on, on people tagging results has led to identify some patterns in some areas exactly. more than other ones. But now, nevertheless, that, you, that your company developed for 10 years this ability to prepare data for other companies, now you've been hired to and tasked with the goal of automating this data labeling and preparation thing. So in other words, reducing the dependence on finding the right talent and, and, and human beings. Why did this need emerge? What is the goal of this? It, it, it's, it's reducing costs or it's because it's difficult to find enough targets, so the volume of data is becoming too large? So that's, that's, that's the main question in all of this interview, I'm guessing. So, I mean, I would, I usually tell this story, right? I mean, so the fact we have so much data available to us is very exciting for us data scientists, right? But I often, I often feel like even when you talk to people who are specialized, have been in this industry for a long time, they don't necessarily realize that most of the data we have, we still need to label because Yes, we can do deep learning now, but mostly you know, like uh, applications will involve the supervised learning and supervised learning requires labeling in most cases. Sometimes your data comes naturally labeled as it would be the case in e-commerce oftentimes because you know like uh, you can label like interest as being this customer did the per made the purchase or did not make the purchase, right? But in many other areas, you don't, it doesn't come naturally labeled. So it's important to label everything. So we are now in something I call the big data labeling crisis, right? Like now this is a new challenge that even though I don't think anyone else is using that term out there, when you tell them, hey, you have so much data to label now, what are you going to do? This is actually a problem. Why are all people uh, in computer vision always defaulting back to ImageNet or another open source data set, right? Because labeling at that scale and high speed is difficult. So you'd rather like use a data set that's already labeled. And, and that itself introduces a bias, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Right. But so, so my, my point here is like too much data to label, what are you going to do? And so there are actually two ways to solve this problem. There is either you label faster using a machine learning algorithm, an independent machine learning algorithm that does not depend on your application 
to generate predictions or annotations. So I can have a model, you have like different versions of YOLO models for predictive bounding boxes, SSD, and, and or several other open source tools. Okay, so these, these are typical image object detection algorithms. Yes, exactly. So let's define that. that, that these, these are ways to detect object detectors. Of, of yes. objects inside, inside the pictures and then create a bounding box, which becomes basically the, the label for the algorithm. Exactly. So you, you have this, uh, these solutions, but as we all know, it's never going to be 100% accurate because guess what? I mean, machine learning is never 100% accurate. And if I'm a self-driving car company, I cannot afford not to have perfect data, right? Because that may be to define the difference between life and death for a person at some point. So it's, it's extremely important to have as accurate as possible. So you cannot just default into this type of solutions. And so you still require a human in the loop approach, which is what we provide. So you have like eventually like a machine learning assisted solution using image detection or object detection, for instance. And then you will ask humans to review this and take care of the corner cases where you, the algorithm actually had a very bad confidence level on the prediction. So that's, that's one way. Let's summarize here. The major problem is the amount of data is growing exponentially. Mm -hmm. There are even not enough people to tag all this stuff. The, the speed with which you can turn work to your customer or in general, the speed with which the industry can leverage new data is, is going down because there are too, too many new data. So what you're trying to do is to increase the speed of this process. So you can, you can label more data so that mm -hmm. you can feed more training processes for, for other companies. And in order to do this, the approach you're taking is an approach where the algorithm does the labeling, but then there is a human that reviews. So basically the human now does not have to touch every single feature. It just says, okay, okay, okay. So there is, there is an error possibility there. And then it says, oops, this is wrong. Let me, let me change the box or let me change the annotation. So, you, so that's just, the process. Just to elaborate on what you say, as you said, right? You can say, okay, okay, okay. I agree with all the predictions. There is also a, a challenge for us from a human computer interfacing point of view that if you show too many things at the same time to the contributor, they're going to do exactly that. They're not going to pay sufficiently enough attention. So we're also building the algorithms that are helping you like figure out how many is too many for a human to see at the same time. And so this is where... You also have a piece of like machine learning plus psychology in this. But so your, your summary is completely like accurate. So that's one way, like using a machine learning assisted approach with a human in the loop piece on top of that to validate, right? And then, then the, yeah, there's the other way which we are exploring. And I'm going to say we're probably one of the, possibly the only company really thinking about the problem that way. I strongly believe that you don't need to label everything because we cannot keep going that trend to like data is going to keep growing exponentially and we're going to have to keep labeling everything. That is not just possible, specifically if you still need a human in that, that concept, right? So I believe, however, that you need the right data because my perception of big data is data grows, the volume of data grows, but the volume of information does not necessarily grow as fast. We have lots of cases where vo the volume of data explodes because you have duplicate versions of the same document online because you have so many images that look very much like, uh, like each other, right? I mean, and you, you have so many different reasons why ultimately big data doesn't mean big information. So why wouldn't you approach the problem by saying that you just need to know what the right data or the important data is for you? And so two things you can think here is like either you find raw value of the data. So that would be called prioritization. Try to remove the duplicates or data points that are too similar to each other. The other way is something called active learning, which is like uh, identify the important data while you are training the model. And so this is something that's extremely appealing to the industry in general. And I think this is going to be the solution to data labeling. Can we dig a little bit more into the technical of this? Maybe without, you know, talking of the specific math of, you know, the loss function mm -hmm. that you use, but let's, let's give kind of an overview how. So first of all, what is active learning? How it is used in this context? Why do you believe this is better than 
I don't know, using the YOLO model to recommend a bounding box to a human being. Now, I, th I think like the value in active learning is really identifying like the data that matters for your problem, right? And so the way you would do that is instead of taking your entire data set, labeling all of it and throwing that into a model you're going to train, you are going to take a semi-supervised approach, which basically like helps you leverage both labeled and unlabeled data. And so the idea is that you would just label a fraction of your data at first you will try to train your model knowing really well that the accuracy of that model is not going to be as good as you need it to be. But then you're going to use that model, that temporary model, to infer on the remainder of the data, the part that's not labeled yet. And you're going to get metadata, like confidence levels, margins, or what's the difference, like the, the margin between the first uh, best prediction and the second best prediction. Bottom line, you're going to get information from this. And from that information, you can start inferring what extra data point would be the most beneficial to your model. For instance, if I know that I try to predict what this image was about and my confidence level is extremely low, that gives me an information that I should really be using that image because this is something that the algorithm did not get at first. And then you do that little by little until you actually dynamically build your training set at the same time you train your model. And so this is a very completely different approach if you compare like the way we were doing data science like five years ago, 10 years ago, where you would have to collect data before you knew what you were going to do with it. Now here, like because of big data, we have an opportunity to build the data set and the right data set for our applications at the same time we're building the model. So while doing this process, well, what I think would be pretty interesting to understand is, is there your intervention as data scientist in this learning process or, or you're using a technology that is fully automated? So it's, you know, starting to select what information it needs to for okay. the training on, a, on cycles, iterative cycles. What is the actual situation there? Is, is a person involved during the training process? So the place where the, like the, are you, no, no, you don't necessarily, so, First of all, I will say this. People are usually like a, a, a conscious that active learning is a model. It's not a model. It's a wrapper around a model. You can really use active learning with anything you want. And no, so you can build logic. And this is the, 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 the service we're providing right now where, I mean, it automatically identifies what is the appropriate data progressively while you train your model. So no, the human, like the data scientist is not involved in this work. The data scientist would be involved in identifying in advance what the right logic. So for instance, I'm going to add like 100 data points with the lowest confidence level from the previous active learning loop, for instance. But that's something you can, I mean, just the same way you would build a model, you can build a querying strategy. That's the way this is called. The place, however, where you actually need a human is if you're going to use this process to identify what data is needed, to be labeled, then you still need to send that chunk of data to be labeled to a human, right? So, so this, is, this is where the human would actually like, uh, be involved in the process. The rest of the process is done automatically. Like Automatically, you would retrain the model, identify the new needed uh, data points, and then you would identify these data points as the new data points that you need to get labeled for the next iteration. So when does a system like this will fail? So, and if it fails, can you predict that? Can, I mean, are there ways while the model is training that, you know, will alert you and say, this thing is not working? Yeah, absolutely. So, so it's, it's a very interesting problem because like this, this has been used in academia for a while. There is, there is like substantial research on the topic, but there is virtually no one uh, using it in the industry with the caveat that people are starting to use it in large companies when they realize they cannot keep labeling everything. So there, there is like a huge opportunity out there. Like uh, really, I think like the companies are starting to realize they cannot keep track of all of their data. Yeah, and so, so I, think, I think it's gonna be interesting where, where the industry is going in, in that sense. So basically summarizing, lots of the innovation where you're working on right now is bringing these active learning frameworks being developed in academia mm -hmm. to a more practical application. Absolutely. I would say that because it's interesting as well that you, even if you read, like you can read papers on the, the topic and usually people try 
a specific querying strategy, there is no framework to identify automatically, given your problem and your data, this is the best query strategy, this is the best logic, this is the best approach, because you have different ways to think about active learning. And uh, they just try and see if it works. And so I think like as per like the, the one of the recent surveys that was done on the topic, I think in 10% of the cases, it just fails. But it fails because I mean, if you take the wrong querying strategy, I can easily see why it would fail, right? And so even in academia, no one has really developed a framework that helps you say, yes, it's going to work, and this is the best logic you should be using for your iterations. And so this is, this is basically what we're developing at Figure 8. So that's very interesting. And if we look at, so you itself already, if you like, working to an innovative approach, at least compared to what is out there in the industry, not necessarily in the academia. Right. But right now, your focus is working on solving this problem that there's so many, there's so many data out there that it, it's not feasible anymore to label them. So where do you think things are going? Do you think that in three years from now, this is the problem that you're still trying to solve? Do you think that the problem will be solved and you'll be working on something else? What's next, basically? No, so I would say, I mean, my personal belief is that the amount of storage is not growing enough to accommodate the growth of the data. And so, you know, like, uh, th that was like my inkling for a while, but I think like there is more and more like, uh, um, you know, like if you, and so I think eventually we're starting to see the end of big data. I mean, big data is like, it's interesting that we have so much data because there has to be something interesting in such a huge amount of data, but there is also like a, a dilution of, of the information in this, in all the data we collect. And so you have like active learning is one way. I mean, even though we're like really trying to, to productionalize this, we, I mean, I also see like more and more companies interested in a few shot learning, one shot learning, right? I mean, and uh, even though this is something that has been developed only for image classification or computer vision problem, I can see how this would take on other use cases as well. But I think the industry is geared towards like, how can you get the same accuracy for model for predictions with a um, subset of the data only? And so active learning is one approach to this, but I don't think this is going to be the only thing. You think this is a problem that can be solved with the technology that we have at hand today, or you expect we will need some different approaches? So for example, in the field of machine learning, there is a conversation that is going on about artificial, artificial intelligence, not strong artificial intelligence. Mm -hmm. And one of the limits of deep learning, one of various limits of deep learning today is that it doesn't have reasoning ability it doesn't have abstraction ability so as soon as you change the context of what you're doing these algorithms basically becomes not utilizable so in that context there is there is a limit and people recognize that there is a limit and the technology has the same thing applies here in the data preparation or we have enough of you know academic research to explore before we kind of saturate somewhere I think, so, I mean, I mean, there are several things like in, in what you're asking here, right? I mean, so yes, I absolutely believe that we don't have the technology yet for an AI to uh, emulate like reasoning, for instance. But what I think like we might be close to getting to is that like, look, my dream as a technologist would be we figure out a way to identify what is the 1% or even like a one in a million data point that actually matters for your model, for your problem? All these images, maybe you just need a couple of them to make sense of everything, right? And so if you were able to say like, this is the one image in all my data set I actually need to make sense of it, then it becomes easy to do online learning, right? I mean, because like now I need to re reload, re-update my model dynamically. The reason why online learning is not used frequently in lots of industries is that... Can uh, we define it? What is online learning, actually? Online, so online learning is like a model, like constantly learning, right? I mean, so readapting re itself as you go. So for instance, for e-commerce, it would be something like as soon as you have a purchase, you throw that new data point of the purchase into your model in order to re-update your search relevance algorithm. And this is just not practical because if you have a purchase every second, you cannot retrain the entire model in one second because it's just too, too heavy, right? I mean, it, it would require like several hours to retrain the whole thing, if not several days. With an online learning approach, if you have like a light version where 
you only need five image to train your model somehow, right? Then you could maybe do that in a more sophisticated way and you could have art an artificial intelligence that can basically like learn on the spot from this new data. If you were able to say with a 100% certainty that this is the data point that's going to make the difference. So I think it opens like brand new possibilities, like active learning and like identifying value in the data set is like what is going to take us one step further in the race to uh, artificial general intelligence. Do you think this will, like, there's going to be a sector where this will come first? So, for example, it's going to be more on the time series analysis, more on the image analysis, more on natural language processing. Which one do you think is more amenable to make more progress? We, I mean, I'm not, obviously, I'm not going to give you, like, details about the type of research we do because that's, uh, that's like, our secret sauce. But we have a general approach that works for everything. I mean, our, our developing an approach that works for everything. Okay, so basically, I couldn't extort you all, all, all the, all no. the, <laughs> very good. So I tried. It was a nice try. You have to admit it. Okay, so so if we look, you know, we we were talking about general artificial intelligence and so on. You know, in the press, there's been a lot of noise because of the of the demands of Elon Musk or yeah. you know Bill Gates and so on. So the Skynet coming, uh, at least people. You know, they, they love to think about Skynet. I like to, to think about the Star Wars robots. So that was pretty useful. Uh, the, the guy from the Star Wars. So where are we at in the development of these technologies? And what we can think is going to happen in the next five years? Will, will we have something like Star Wars computer or something like Machina, the, the movie, where, where she kills the guy and runs away and was right. to feel no, so I think we need like absolute measurement of the actual value of a specific data point in the context of a specific task to me, like is, is something or one of the few like uh, elements we need to get there. And I don't know for sure this is going to happen in the next five years. I would say like once we reach that, I would be fairly confident that it becomes easier to have self-learning robots. I would say like if your question is around like uh, are we gonna be you know like a uh, swamped with like a uh, like a robots like with bad intentions and then stuff like in the next few years I will almost say like this is the wrong question to ask because like to me like uh, as researchers I think we're doing the right thing to try to move technology forward. It's, it's the same problem with every technology if you have like you don't think about the ethics part of it if you don't think about like people using technology with the wrong intentions or like either on purpose or not on purpose. It's, it's going to be a problem anyways, right? I mean, this is potentially very powerful technology and in the wrong hands or if we're not careful enough in the way we move this forward for society, it can be a problem, right? But like, I don't see that as being like a problem caused by the technology. It's caused by the usage of the technology. Yeah, so I think my interest was more on the technology itself rather than you know right. why the, the implications so my interest is more what it takes to move right. from where we are today which is highly specifically trained models right. to get closer to a level of if not like exactly okay. human intelligence but a level of you know more right. broader intelligence than right. So I think I think I really like, like I said as I said before right I don't believe big data is the answer to artificial general intelligence I do believe that as like I, I think we have to think about how do we learn as humans and we learn through transfer learning right I mean we learn something and we really apply the same skill into something else I don't think transfer learning is well understood like it does not work that well for NLP for instance it does work well for image so as long as we don't advance research on that space and like how do you transfer across tasks right not just across data sets I think like this is something that needs to be understood better before we move forward and uh, towards like artificial general intelligence and I also believe that reinforcement learning has to move forward I think like there is a tremendous potential in um, in uh, deep reinforcement learning actually you know like I will even say like to move forward with this this is also something we're thinking about at figure eight like if you want to do that the right way you need to have a way to collect the right like to, to build the right reward functions you have to worry about data you have to worry about the reward function you're going to use and uh, there is no one on the market offering you as a service like the capability of building the right reward function for your deep learning application so that's that's also something that i mean more like efforts into doing this the right way will be super important but 
you put reinforcement learning together, you put a transfer learning together, and you put like ways to reduce the amount of data needed for a system to learn anything. I think important steps for the technology community to move forward here. So that's very, that's very interesting. And it's actually a viewpoint. It's a little bit different than some of the things I've seen in literature because there, there are some researchers, you know, that are looking into kind of selecting the right type of model and having other mm-hmm. algorithms that select the other type of model and so forth. So, you know, we, we're getting close to the end of our interview. So what is your wish, your personal wish for, you know, like the, the specific sector that you're in? Like what, what, what do you believe, what do you believe the next couple of years will look like in, in the data preparation realm and the application of machine learning to this? Realm? No, I mean, I, for, for me, like the, the holy grail here is like really like finding ways to ensure that you can have really high quality data as well. Like, because I think like from an ethics point of view, th- this is what kind of makes me nervous here, right? I mean, if you provide the bad bad data to the rest of the world, if people are going to use that for medical applications, for like self-driving vehicles, I mean, it can be a disaster if they have the wrong data. And so it's, for me, it's critical to find ways to provide like extremely highly accurate labels for whoever we're serving here. And for me, originally, like the reduction of the number of data points needed to train a model was an opportunity to make sure you had the right labor onto this labeling, right? I mean, but like my my goal and my focus is really like ensuring everybody gets the the data that they need and that they deserve for their applications. So that's very important, also very relevant. These aspects of machine learning and data science and and artificial intelligence has to do with the, you know, the data, the data preparation is often not to report in the media that much, but it's actually crucial. And as Jennifer said, in the next few years, as machine learning applications will become more popular and more spread into vital elements of uh, our society, such as, you know, the healthcare and making healthcare decisions, making transportation decisions. And so life of people will be impacted here. The, the relevance of this sector is going to be higher and higher. So with that said, Jennifer, I wanted to thank you. It was me, it's been a pleasure to have you here with us. We wish you all the best and we appreciate so much your passion for, for the sector. And yes, yeah, so all the best and have a nice day. Thank you so much. Have a nice day too. Okay. Hello, goodbye to everybody. Bye-bye.